I too am going to add my thanks. It's an enormous privilege to be here and I'd start by saying that as I shared with my co-panelists, of course, the major thing that strikes me straight up about what has changed since I joined the profession is that a conference and a conversation of this kind would never be opened by a panel of three women. I'm going to hope that this is going to work. Yes. I arrive here transatlantically. My first job, Bristol, 1980. My office in the building in the foreground. Mrs. Thatcher had just been elected Prime Minister. Higher education, having expanded enormously in the 60s and the 70s, was about to undergo huge cuts. In 1982, for example, Bristol decided to close its architecture department. We demonstrated, I'm there somewhere in the crowd. Sounds familiar? Um, perhaps this is the moment to point out that virtually all university education in the UK is public education. And the recurrent intensified emphasis here on accountability within public education and the constant justification, accreditation, and mission statement writing that comes with it makes me feel really far too much at home. I've brought with me, nonetheless, a highly serviceable vocabulary involving such phrases as transferable skills, as well as no ifs, no buts, no education cuts. And in fact, when I was putting together remarks for today, it struck me how easily I was falling back myself into the hortatory, exhortatory rhetoric of the early 1980s. And really, I'm not going to make any apology for the return of the tub thumping. But in so many other respects, things are very different. When I arrived in Bristol, I was the one faculty member making a point of teaching women's writing. The department was stuffed full of the intellectual sons and daughters of F.R. Levis. There was no real research culture, no research assessment exercise on which so much UK funding now depends. At Bristol, no literary theory was taught at all. So I decided after coming back from my first ever conference in the spring of 1980, organized by that brand new shiny radical group, Literature Teaching Politics, very carefully, no punctuation in that, um, I decided I'd better do something about this. So I went on an alarmingly speedy and superficial crash course of Derrida and Lacan and Kristeva for just as I was feminism in the department, so I was literary theory. And when a colleague and I decided that we really did need to include some recent literature in the department's offerings, not against, I might say, opposition, what did we pick that was controversial? Things fall apart and Seamus Heaney's poetry. When I moved to Oxford in 1985, there was, by contrast, a long-standing research culture. And there was a critical theory option for undergraduates. But I was immediately involved in implementing diversity in the syllabus once again, again against resistance, setting up a woman's writing option. And I found myself in trouble in the 1990s teaching Native American, Chicano, and Asian American writers on the American literature course. There may not be questions on them in the exam, I was told, so people wouldn't send me their students. So if the emphasis on diversity was felt earlier and more extensively within this country than in certain places within the UK, it's still worthwhile remembering how recent the teaching and the impact of theory and the disruption and reconstruction of the canon has been, let alone the shifts that we've all of us witnessed in the composition both of faculty and of student bodies. But back to Bristol, the early 1980s and the tools of my trade. I left out the um, typewriter and the carbon paper on which I was doing the earlier stuff. So I wrote my dissertation and all kinds of early articles on the typewriter just like this. 
I took notes, wrote lectures longhand to uh, retrieve and store information. There were um, card catalogues in archives and libraries to show images. One borrowed slides from a slide library or had them made by the physics department. One used an overhead projector. One passed around a book. These things, as George Eliot wrote in a famous relation of example to general principles, these things are a parable. So I'm using them to illustrate three major areas of change since I entered the profession. The rapid shifts in the curriculum, the impact of technology, and by extension, for looking back at the early 1980s, I remember going about things in a very amateur, if politically totally charged way. My third point is the growth within the profession of an ethos of professionalism itself. Curricular shifts, as we all know, are readily visible. The incorporation of theory, the prominence given to African-American, U.S. minority literatures, world Anglophone texts, the presence not just of women's writing as a matter of course, but of queer studies, masculinity studies, of graphic novels, of new media. And also, particularly, though not exclusively at the graduate level, the way we've incorporated into our syllabi studies in the history of the book, in the theory and practices of reading, and also the integration of visual studies. Of course, when it comes to undergraduate teaching, like I imagine all of us, I'm grateful for the expansion and explosion of the canon so that we can easily pair so-called familiar and unfamiliar texts in order to get students, we hope, to read critically and with curiosity about their own and other cultures and times, shaking up their imagination as well as their analytical skills. That they read, read print texts far less than 30 years ago perhaps goes without saying, though I do think that this fact is significantly impacts on the way in which many people view what we do as not just somehow indulgent, but even esoteric. As faculty, and when working with graduates, we find ourselves increasingly researching within our own disciplines, sure, but also reshaping them in interdisciplinary centers. Interdisciplinary studies in the early 1980s often meant in practice preparing a seminar along the lines of, you take Mary Barton, I'll take the history of Chartism. But now intellectual collaboration is so much more frequently and profitably located in centers outside and inside, outside and across departments, like our own Center for Critical Analysis at Rutgers, which brings in people from the sciences and social sciences, as well as the humanities, in year-long seminars with deliberately interdisciplinary titles like evidence and explanation. And yet, as Manand points out in his recent and not unproblematic, The Marketplace of Ideas, however innovative such centers may be to our practices of thinking, talking, and planning the intellectual future, they rarely hire people in their own right. And I think that this makes them quickly vulnerable on the terrain that we share with the early 1980s and my continual mantra today, the problem of cuts in education funding. It's great to be able to show you our CCA website. Um, I have to get back a couple. When I bought my first computer in 1985, it was an Amstrad, green type on a gray screen one font only, painfully slow. The World Wide Web didn't come into being till 1991. Email only started to become a widespread form of communication in 1993. Electronic resources, apparent instant democracy. We can all access Google Books, say, or get emails from colleagues and students at two in the morning, or construct new anti-electronic device laws to aim at focusing attention in class just like the good old days. And as here, one can readily find material online with which to illustrate one's points. What's more, new technologies have given birth to new forms of scholarship within the humanities, 
whether it be work exclusively discussing new media or explicitly linking new to old. And I'm thinking here of a work like Tim Murray's discussion in Digital Baroque, both of the dialogue between contemporary screen arts and early modern creative thought and production. And then the way in which he moves on to consider how today's digital world can make one think differently about temporal, temporality, spatiality, linearity, and simultaneity. Or one can think online of the pioneering Rossetti archive. Or there are the number of digitized searchable archives distributed by, in particular, Adam Matthews. But here, one runs headlong, not just into the kind of um, trouble we were talking about with reducing research to search engines, but actually into the question of finances. For the growth of subscription-only databases and all the wonderful material available through them, is quickly reinforcing the distinction that already exists in library provisions between the well-to-do and the less well-funded institutions, even, and I say this with feeling, among Research One universities. So yes, I keep harking back to the question of money. And this isn't just the obsession, though I admit to being obsessed, of a department chair in a cash-strapped university in a cash-strapped state. Or for that matter, someone who read in yesterday's Guardian that English university budgets are once again to be slashed by up to 14%. Without doubt, the profession has been transformed since I joined it by professionalization. The training of graduate students, not just in research methods, but in paper giving, publication submission, interview techniques, job talk delivery, the mentoring of junior faculty to make them aware of what's expected for tenure and what seems like a creeping upward of the expectations to pass that tenure bar. And I think talking about postdocs and new faculty fellows of the humanities, however welcome these two-year appointments might be to graduate students um, at the outset of their careers, has this danger of raising those presumed qualifications for tenure um, down the line. Add to the publication requirements for tenure the category of service to the department, the university, professional organizations, and the demands on our young scholars over and above teaching what are often increasingly large classes look tough. It's a very different world because admittedly I joined the profession in a country without a legalized tenure system. Nonetheless, entering the profession, I could see something resembling an easy progression of the kind that in 1980, I was just, just in time to experience. Without yet having completed my doctorate then, I used my eclectic Oxford University and Courtauld History of Art Education to cheerfully talk my way into a job. Could I teach Marlowe? Check. Wallace Stevens? Check. Mallory and Tennyson? Check. I mean, the fact that my dissertation was on 19th century British art criticism didn't really seem to matter. I seemed to fit that pre-existent model of generalist. As we've already heard, and it's not something that I'm going to repeat, one question that hangs heavily over this weekend's conference is the relationship of professionalization um, to the new academic world with increasingly few permanent jobs in the humanities, with our highly trained, still idealistic graduate students existing in a climate driven by a highly materialistic notion of education's benefits. I was lucky entering in 1980 in that I could disrupt from within and the disruption in which I was privileged to engage was very much in line with the opportunities for expansiveness that literary studies have always appeared to offer, whether I think of the kind of teaching or research that I've practiced, asking questions driven by developments outside as well as within the two disciplines in which I've got formal training. 
If the humanistic scholars who first employed me adhered, for the most part, to one particular version of the great tradition, they nonetheless expected their new hire not to be bound tight by one particular period or narrowly defined field. The questions that mattered to them valued in particular the synthesis of ethics and imagination that literature stimulated. And these were questions to which I and so many more of my generation added an emphasis on the political and the transformative, which means that I very much add my own voice now in support of the idea of the importance of generalization, at least in the sense of finding and asking questions about the big topic. So it depresses me enormously to read my university president's response this week to New Jersey's latest round of cuts, saying that we must point out to our legislature that, quotes, funding higher education is an investment that drives economic expansion and opportunity. These sentiments parallel the 2003 report on university research commissioned by the UC system in which, as Christopher Newfield notes, the word literary appeared in the entire report exactly once in the following sentence about a public art installation at UCSD. Projects include Terry Allen's trees, three preserved eucalyptus trees encased in metal, individually known as the music tree, literary tree, and third tree installed between the campus library and faculty club. It's easy enough to believe in the importance of literary studies from within the discipline, however loosely we conceive of it. What I think has changed significantly since the time that I joined this profession is that urgency with which we need to convince not just the outside world, but the humanities in general, and from our perspective, literature in particular, are far from unprofitable subjects. We need to redefine, indeed, the ways in which profits are thought about in our institutions. But we also, along with this, have to convince our institutions from within the need to promote the humanities. We have to find convincing ways of speaking up for the importance of the knowledge and methods that we are producing and transmitting. Electronic technologies might mean fewer literal dead trees, but we really can't afford to end up like Alan's eucalyptus encased in its lead shroud. And as I see our conversation over the next hours today and tomorrow as being so much about arming ourselves with the ammunition to say what is important, how do we justify what do we do, how do we speak not just to our colleagues, but how do we speak outside our departments, outside our divisions, and speak first to the university communities as a whole, and then to the so-called general public. <laughs>